this video is sponsored by NordVPN. I'll have a little ad spot a little later on in the video, but if you're considering supporting this channel in any way, consider checking out my affiliate link, nordvpn.com slash jose. This book sucks. In 2016, conservative commentator and guy who will absolutely not go to any gay barbecues, Ben Shapiro decided he would take a break from penning an endless series of books about how to own the left with facts and logic, and decided to try his hand at writing some fiction. The title of his first original novel is True Allegiance. This is not a good book. Do not buy or read it. And now with that disclaimer out of the way, let's get started. The first thing that a person sees when opening up this book is a terrific cell phone. The very first page includes praise for the book, including this quote from Salon. Meet our new Ayn Rand. Of course, the full quote actually reads, Meet our new Ayn Rand. Ben Shapiro's ham-fisted propaganda fiction is even worse than you guessed. But it's actually even worse than that. Even though the book calls it Praise for True Allegiance, this article was published in 2015, a year before True Allegiance was released. The author was actually taking a shot at Ben Shapiro's short story collection titled What's Fair that was published digitally that year. The rest of the accolades come from conservative fixtures and a few creative types. Here's a brief sample. It's prophetic. Just a little too real for comfort. Is it really fictional? A uh, yes to that last one. That's how novels work. But to address the other comments, the opening pages of this book are trying very hard to convince us that this book describes a plausible depiction of the real world. I want you to think about that as we go through its plot. This is a tough book to read, particularly in public. You have to hold it in just such a way that no one can tell you're reading a book by Ben Shapiro. The actual prose is a lot easier to grasp. The novel is split into three parts, with chapters divided amongst five central characters, although Ben breaks this rule, drifting to other characters all the time. The main character is Bret Hawthorne. And yes, I do need to say it like that. Bret Hawthorne is the youngest general in US history at 41. He spends most of this novel murdering terrorists and getting angry at those damn liberals who would rather send them winter coats. Our next major character is President Mark Prescott. He's a president obsessed with how he's perceived in the media, and he's trying to appease the American population by bringing the troops back home and going massively into debt to China to pay for work programs. He's generally a cowardly guy. He's also a thinly veiled combination of Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. Our next major character is Ellen Hawthorne, Brett's wife. Ellen does something working for the governor of Texas. Um, I think she's an aide for him. It's really hard to tell because she goes from photographing dead children at the border to leading the National Guard, and then she's suddenly uh, like a proxy for the governor. I, I really don't know what her specific title is. She just does whatever the plot needs her to do. Next, we've got Soledad Ramirez. She runs a ranch that falls on hard times when the EPA shuts down access to a river to protect a threatened species. It prevents her from watering her cattle and destroys her ranch, so she resorts to terrorism. This is an obvious nod to the Clive and Bundy story of a few years back when ranchers took over a government building because he wanted to keep using land stolen from the government. Our last character is, brace yourself for this one, Levon Williams, a drug dealer from Detroit who hustles his way into a civil rights movement that's a stand-in for Black Lives Matter. If there's one character who will just drive you up a wall with the naked racism of it, it's Levon. So uh, look forward to that. And so there we have our principal cast, three protagonists and two antagonists. The book opens with a prologue that takes us into the story In Media Reis. It's a scene from further along in the story where the George Washington Bridge is collapsing after a terrorist bombing. Leaving that aside from now, let's go to the first chapter where Bret Hawthorne is stationed in Afghanistan, which is quickly falling into the hands of the Taliban after the feckless left-wing President Prescott decided to pull out the majority of the troops. As Kabul crumbles around him, we learn about Bret's backstory. We find out he has a friend named Derek who taught him how to get out of scraps using his wits instead of fighting. Fun fact about the rest of this book, every scrap Bret gets into, he escapes by beating up or murdering the other person. We don't hear from his buddy Derek, who the book is quick to tell us is his black friend, until much later on when we find out he grew up to become a plot device. 
Brett and Ellen have a special way of saying goodbye to one another. Take a bullet for you, babe. I shuddered every time I had to read that. Back in the United States, we meet President Prescott. He's recently come up with a new governmental program called the Work Freedom Program to get Americans working again. Here's a fun fact that I'm sure is just a coincidence. One of the campaign slogans the Nazis used in the 1930s was work, freedom, and bread. The phrase comes up from a 19th century German novel, Arbeit macht frei, where criminals attained freedom through work. It was also the phrase emblazoned on the gates to concentration camps. I think Ben is trying to suggest something here by having the president create a work freedom program. As Prescott delivers his speech, we meet Soledad, who has decided to take the impending doom of her ranch into her own hands when she hires someone to bomb a U.S. federal building. The woman who bombed an office belonging to the U.S. government is a hero, but the Taliban soldiers who bombed the U.S. embassy in Kabul two chapters ago are villains. It's strange to see a book use such frightening morality that justifies actions on the basis of the one performing them, but here we are. Soledad, captive in her ranch, is surrounded by law enforcement who would easily arrest this one fifty-something year old lady, except that there are dozens of biker ranchers surrounding them, ready to die for Soledad. I guess they're ready to just go to war with the cops, okay. Next we go to Detroit to meet Levon, who's got a fancy crack operation because Ben's knowledge of black culture is from movies from the 1970s and 80s. Levon meets Jim Crawford, a civil rights leader who takes Levon under his wing after Levon poorly quotes Hamlet. Jim responds, Quoting dead honkies, you might be useful yet. Ben thinks that's what black people talk like. Then, in the same chapter, we cut away to a new character, Officer Ricky O'Sullivan, who is confronted by a young boy named Kendrick Malone late at night. Apparently, this boy was just wandering around the streets of Detroit in the middle of the night. I can't describe the madness of this scene, so let me just read some of it. As a bit of context, O'Sullivan thinks Kendrick has a gun concealed in his pants, but at this point, he can't see it. Fuck you, honky, the kid shot back. Get the fuck out of my neighborhood. Then he laughed. A cute kid's laugh. O'Sullivan looked for sympathy behind those eyes. Found none. Oh shit, O'Sullivan thought. Then he said, hands up, right now. It goes on like this for a little while, but later in the scene, You go home, white boy, said the kid. His hand moved lower. Suddenly, O'Sullivan's head filled with a sudden clarity, his brain with a preternatural energy. He recognized the feel of the adrenaline hitting. He wasn't going to get shot in the corner of Iowa and Van Dyke outside a shitty convenience store and in a shitty town by some eight-year-old, bleed out in the gutter of some city the world left behind. He had a life, too. The gun felt alive in his hand. The gun was life. Yeah, that's right. The kid is eight. As you might have guessed, this ends with the cop murdering the child. And after he realizes he just shot a child who was holding a toy gun, not a real one, we get this line. When he looked up, he saw them coming. Dozens of them. The citizens of Detroit, coming out of the darkness, congregating. He could feel their eyes. Soledad's chapter also ended with people surrounding law enforcement, but in that case it was the heroic biker ranchers surrounding the cruel cops who were trying to arrest this harmless woman who bombed a government building. In this chapter, it's a bunch of scary black people surrounding this innocent cop whose only crime was murdering an eight-year-old. I would almost think that this symmetry was intentional. I'm not sure Ben is that clever, unless he was trying to expose his ridiculous bias here. This is Ben's way of showing us who the good people are and who the bad people are. It underscores what I mentioned earlier. Their actions aren't material, it's their identity that will inform who we should consider a protagonist and who we should consider an antagonist. And next we finally meet Brett's wife, Ellen. The chapter we meet her in is boring, but it establishes that she works for Governor Bubba Davis of Texas, and that there are drug dealers arriving in Texas by helicopter, and they murder one of Ellen's friends, and this plot point doesn't have any lasting ramifications aside from letting us know that the border is soft and under threat by Mexican- I, I mean, drug dealers, right? It's, it's drug dealers who are coming across the border, sure. 
Ben is cramming a lot of topics into this story. I'd say way too many for 266 pages, but who am I to disagree with the cool kids philosopher? Back in Afghanistan, Brett Hawthorne finds out that the US has been betrayed by the US ambassador to Afghanistan. Apparently this guy was a big donor to the Prescott campaign, and he was rewarded with becoming ambassador to Afghanistan. Honestly, that sounds more like a punishment than anything else. Uh, maybe this is why he betrayed America. We never really get an answer to the question of why he betrayed America. The plot point is pretty much dropped after this revelation. It's a brief scene where Brett opens the ambassador's briefcase, finding a map with two sets of coordinates, one set in Iran and one set in Iraq. And from there, he somehow figures out the ambassador sold Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction to Iran. I'm not sure how <laughs> figured this one out. He just kind of did. Ben also helpfully rewrote history by giving Saddam Hussein nuclear weapons he never had. I don't know why he couldn't just pretend it was chemical weapons that were never found, but Saddam had nukes in this story. Whatever. After that, Brett gets captured by some terrorists. Governor Bubba Davis gets a lengthy introduction. We find out that the governor was once a big player in the oil industry, and then he ran for office when he found out the Environmental Protection Agency was threatening the production of oil. It's amazing how a rich oil tycoon running for office to protect his own business is presented as some kind of hero in this book. It seems like there's a problem with the system if a rich person can afford to run for office when their money is at threat. Here's a passage from the book describing Bubba's campaign. In his opening campaign speech, he named the three top environmental officers in the state and read off how much they'd received from lobbyists from the environmentalists, and how much those environmental groups received from global competitors like the Saudi government. Why would Saudi Arabia, which makes its money off of oil, want to finance people protesting against oil? Or are these environmentalists specifically against American oil? Typically, they argue for green energy and getting off oil entirely. It doesn't make sense. Even when Ben is writing fiction, his conspiracy theories don't seem believable. Also, this scene of an angry Bubba reminded me of something. Well, go fuck yourself then, he sputtered, slamming the phone down on his carefully crafted maple desk. He looked up. Oh, hey Ellen, glad you're back. I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Back with Soledad, she's eventually spirited away from her ranch by Aiden Foster, formerly in law enforcement. Aiden just couldn't stomach being on that side anymore. And oh god, here we go, back in Levon's story, we find out that the recently murdered eight-year-old Kendrick was actually sent there by Levon and Jim so they could manufacture a story about the cops shooting a kid. Yeah, that's really how it happened. Ben has given us the most ghoulish black activists I've seen in a book in a very long time. A large group of, as the book puts it, mostly young black men start protesting. Levon, who is apparently a master of manipulating the media, tricks them into covering the story from the angle that the shooting of an eight-year-old kid is wrong. I'm not sure you need to trick the media into believing that a child getting shot by a cop is a bad thing, but that's how this novel frames it. Ben introduces a new character who gets a focal point chapter just for this one time only. He's a terrorist from the Middle East, and you better believe his name is Muhammad. In Muhammad's story, we also meet Ibrahim Ashami, a Bin Laden-like figure who, in spite of being a Salafist terrorist, is somehow being supported by Iran. Considering how much ISIS and Iran are at odds with one another, this is a stretch. It's supposed to be showing readers that theocratic Muslims will put aside their differences when it comes to fighting against America. This reads into a broader paranoia about Muslims, that they will one day create a universal alliance and start attacking the West. It's a grotesque caricature of Muslims and Islam in general, and it's also exactly what Osama bin Laden was trying to do on 9-11. By having the US respond violently in the Middle East, he was hoping all Muslims would unite together and team up to fight America. And 18 years later, it's pretty obvious that he failed. We also get this line, where Muhammad is sitting in a cafe in Tehran and getting very frustrated. He was getting sick of listening to the Western-style sinful music blasting over the speakers. What, he asked himself, does it mean to hit me, baby, one more time?
So I guess in Iran, music is over 20 years out of date. And pretty neat that they, I guess, can play American music right there in public. Mohammed picks up a nuke from a Russian guy, which is weird because I thought it was the American ambassador to Afghanistan who was hooking them up with Saddam Hussein's nukes, unless this ambassador was also working for Russia. It's never really explained because Russia's involvement and the ambassador, all this stuff is just sort of forgotten about. Brett is in the hands of a Shami, and we get a terrible comeback line when Brett, after hearing America get talked down to by a Shami, says, We live for something. We live to kill bastards like you. Most of Brett's lines read like this one. While captive, Brett sees a landmark through an open window and somehow figures out not only is he in Tehran, but that he must be at the same coordinates on the map he found in the briefcase. I, I don't know how he puts that one together. Brett is filmed in a hostage video, and he sends a message back to America by blinking in Morse code. This was first done in 1966 by Jeremiah Denton when he spelled out torture while describing his captivity in Vietnam. Ben even describes it in this book. While Denton only blinked out torture, Brett manages to blink out airstrike now 5142313569610. Somehow the terrorists don't notice one of the most famous examples of an American sending a secret message back home, or that he's blinking really weirdly for three minutes. Also, those coordinates are in the middle of Tehran, so to kill a Shami, Brett is asking the president to launch an airstrike on the capital city of Iran. This would start a war killing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, but in Brett's mind, that's worth it to get one terrorist. Because Prescott isn't a complete maniac, he decides to send in a special forces team instead. Except he waited four days, letting Ashami slip through their fingers, and Brett apparently didn't need that team to save him anyway because even though he's got a broken arm and he's been awake for two days straight, he's able to murder both of his guards and escape. And on the way out, he saves the team that had come to rescue him because the building has been set up to explode and he just sort of hauls them out of there. I'm not sure why the building exploded, or why there were only two guards, though. The terrorists can't afford recruits, but they can afford extra bombs for all their buildings. Brett knows Muhammad is heading to America for another attack. He doesn't tell the president because he thinks he's a giant wimp, so he decides to solve this problem alone. In the wake of all these events, we finally get the bombing of the George Washington Bridge from way back in the prologue. Back in Texas, Governor Davis is using the National Guard to patrol the border, which is, from the book's perspective, working really nicely by turning the southern part of Texas into a police state. It's a bit frightening how often this book talks about how nice it is to have armed military personnel everywhere. Since the president hates America, he's annoyed by safety at the border. But Bubba doesn't care. He's just a Texas badass. Ben loves his characters. In Detroit, Levon is unveiling his master plan to get the city to bow to the will of his angry black man mob so he can start making reforms to the police system. He wants an all-black police force, and this apparently means they'll have to have lower education standards and allow in more criminals. Gee, I wonder what Ben is saying about the black community here. We're getting a character of a civil rights leader in the making and it's being used to make a broader point about the black community. It's not the legacy of racism that's held them back, but the evil people who take advantage of the community's rage and loose moral character. They seem like a violent and angry community, easily led astray by the worst members inside of it. Unless you doubt his expertise, Ben has intimate knowledge of the black community. Remember this line from earlier on? Quoting dead honkies, you might be useful yet thanks to a Republican district attorney, the officer who shot the child won't be charged, and people are getting angrier. Back in the US, Brett is trying to track down Muhammad, and we get a cringy scene where Ben Shapiro reveals he doesn't understand what racial profiling is. In this scene, a Port Authority security guy is refusing to help Brett racial profile records of people entering the US. Look, Brett burst out, losing his patience. I don't give a rat's ass at this point whether it's racial profiling or not. Maybe you're right. Maybe Muhammad is a light-skinned Norwegian woman or a Cherokee elder. Or maybe he's a Persian or Arabic-looking son of a bitch who hangs out with other Persian or Arabic-looking sons of bitches who look like Ibrahim Ashami. If I end up being wrong and he looks like Helen Mirren, feel free to tell the New York Times editorial board about it. At this point in the story, Brett has a physical description of Muhammad. In an earlier scene, he describes him He's about 5 foot 9, 140, skinny, maybe 17 years old. Blue eyes, angular face, sharp, big nose. 
So if he knows he's looking for an Arabic guy and has such a specific description, how is that racial profiling? Racial profiling is questioning people on the basis of their race, not targeting a specific person whose ethnicity you know and who you have reason to believe will commit a crime. Maybe Brett is worried about a fake name, but looking up an Arabic man that he has already seen makes perfect sense. It's the difference between stopping someone on the street because they look like someone who is trying to commit a crime and stopping someone on the street because they belong to a certain ethnic group that you just happen to believe commits crimes. You have a crime which you have evidence is going to occur versus an imagined crime that you think might occur because that racial group is always responsible for crimes. You see the difference now? Ben, I suspect, doesn't. We also finally get to hear from Brett's best friend, Derek. Remember him? Well, he's not just your token good black guy, he's also your token Muslim, because he goes by Hassan Abdul. And what makes him a good Muslim, you ask? Well, he infiltrates mosques and informs on other Muslims to the government. His role in this book is to hand off some information to Brett and then get murdered, because uh, he's just a plot device, not a character. Bubba Davis sends Ellen to parlay with the president as Prescott demands the National Guard be taken from the border to help the cleanup in New York City after the bridge was bombed. On Soledad's side of things, we find out that her new right-hand man, Aiden, is childhood friends with Ricky O'Sullivan, the cop who shot the eight-year-old black child. So now the threads are coming together as Soledad's team decides to head to Detroit to rescue Ricky. Their plan is kind of weird. They're going to have the biker ranchers drive into the middle of the angry mob which has congregated outside the prison Ricky is currently staying in. The biker wrenchers will start a fight, and as things turn violent, they'll sneak Ricky out in the confusion. While this is going on, Levon has Jim, his civil rights mentor, murdered, leaving Levon in control of the movement. Remember Ashami? The terrorist who's apparently the mastermind behind all these attacks? You might as well forget about him, because we found a new Muslim leader who will be the focus for the rest of this book. Muhammad and his nuke have hooked up with an imam named Omari, who runs a major mosque in the US. Omari has close ties to the president because, of course, the left-wing president is unknowingly friends with a terrorist. The president is bending to all of Levon's requests, like letting him influence the police department not just in Detroit, but eventually in cities across the US. And now I'm just going to skip ahead to the end of Levon's story here, because from this point on, nothing really happens. He becomes more powerful, and he gets everything he wants, because the president is afraid of being called a racist. I'll have more to say about Levon later on. Soledad is finding more people deserting her terrorist cell, and soon the only ones left are her, Aiden, and Officer Ricky. The last biker to leave them is a guy named Ezekiel, who Ben helpfully lets us know is black and this guy betrays them. He's secretly been working with the US government, and he gives a scarf with a tracking device implanted on it to Soledad. It's also strange that he's the only biker whose race is explicitly mentioned. Just a detail I noticed. Soledad gives that bugged scarf to Aiden, and it's in his hands when the president, you know, the feckless coward who would have tea with a terrorist, decides to order a drone strike on American soil. Personally, I think it would be easier to just arrest three people who are driving around on motorcycles, but I guess the drone is, uh, I don't I, I don't know, doesn't make sense. Since Aiden is the one holding the tracking device, the operation is botched, and it's Aiden who's killed when Soledad was originally the main target. This brutal murder hardens Soledad, so much so that she's decided she needs to assassinate the president. She's still supposed to be one of the heroes, by the way. Back with Brett... He's now running around with the evidence from his now-dead best friend that Omari is working with Muhammad, and they secretly are going to plan some sort of terrorist attack in New York City. All while Brett is trying to stay one step ahead of the president's goons, I guess the president wouldn't want to know about an impending terror attack because he's friends with the guy perpetrating it. Ellen arrives in New York trying to find her husband, and we learn that Muhammad wasn't in New York to bomb the George Washington Bridge. He's actually part of a second bombing plot, this one to detonate a nuke inside of New York City. From what I can gather, the plan was to set off one large bomb in New York City on the George Washington Bridge. Then the president would call back the military from Afghanistan to help with the cleanup. And then, with all that military personnel concentrated, they would detonate a second bomb to kill everyone. In this case, the bomb would be a nuke. 
generally speaking, I think detonating a nuclear weapon inside of New York City is going to be a knockout punch no matter what comes before it or how much military may or may not be inside there. But I'm not the terrorist mastermind in a Pen Shapiro novel, so what do I know? Amari is now the guy who's detonating the nuke, and his plan is to do so during the president's big speech in New York City where he's pushing his new work freedom program. Brett mindlessly wanders through the crowd during the president's speech when he bumps into Soledad. He notices her arm in her purse in a way that can only be understood as her secretly holding onto a gun. I'm not kidding, here's how Ben describes that in the book. He'd seen that arm angle before. He knew what a person looked like before they pulled a gun from concealment. He could feel the threat before he even knew he felt it. He could feel it before he felt it. That's just... Ah, that's good writing, isn't it? Brett grabs Soledad, the gun goes off not shooting anyone, and Brett is the one who's tackled by the president's goon as Soledad just melts into the crowd. Brett is placed under arrest, and in that commotion, Omari decided not to detonate the nuke. I'm not really sure why he waited, but the president decides to fly away with his inner circle. That includes Omari and Ellen, who he's decided is now a hostage to use against Governor Bubba. As they're in the air, President Prescott decides to circle over New York City a few times for a photo op. Seizing on this opportunity, Omari is going to threaten to detonate the nuke. Ellen rises to the occasion in this moment by confronting Omari when all the other passengers can't, described in this unbelievable line. The other passengers looked around uncomfortably, paralyzed by a peculiar inability to overcome their political correctness. That's right, the passengers are too politically correct to stop someone trying to detonate a bomb. Or maybe he wasn't trying to detonate a bomb. Omari said he wanted to negotiate with Prescott to get some sort of concession. But Ellen reacts too quickly, and instead, she detonates the nuke. Instead of stopping the terrorist, she does his job for him and blows up a nuke over New York City and killing hundreds of thousands. The book tells us it's only hundreds of thousands, but the blast, I guess, would only kill that many. The fallout would kill millions. I don't think Ben understands fallout because Brett is in New York City when this happens and he somehow is fine. You wouldn't be. If a nuclear bomb exploded over a city, the fallout would kill so many people. Well, we already know Ben doesn't understand nukes, right? Because of this clip. President Trump wanted to nuke hurricanes, which, by the way, I don't even care whether it does anything. It just sounds cool. Just the idea. Anytime you're talking about nuking a random thing that's not really going to hurt anybody, I'll admit, the 13-year-old boy in me is kind of for it. Oh, God. He's so dumb. I bet you didn't expect that plot twist, though, right? Ben is ending his book by nuking New York City. But wait, there's an epilogue! In it, we find out that our new president is going to be former VP Allison Martin, who, for some reason, we have not heard about until now. She blames the nuke going off on Ellen, which is more accurate than she realizes. But she thinks it was because Ellen was a suicide bomber sent by the governor of Texas, which is as good a pretense as any to lead the country into a civil war. We also get a glimpse outside of the U.S. borders where we find an international coalition led by China, including Europe, Japan, Canada, and Russia, who are launching a massive invasion of the United States. This comes completely out of nowhere and makes no sense whatsoever. It's maybe the dumbest thing in this book, and it's a very competitive field. And in the closing scene, we see Brett rescued from prison by Soledad, and together they're going to start a new terror cell. Which means a sequel! <laughs> Some people use VPN for enhanced security and safety. Personally, I use it for accessing different parts of the internet that aren't accessible in my home country of Canada. One of my favorite shows to watch on Netflix is Kim's Convenience. It's a really great Canadian show about a Korean family that has a convenience store in my hometown of Toronto. It just finished up its third season, but if I go to Canadian Netflix, you'll see there are only two seasons. Season three is coming on October 2nd. Of course, that's not the case for other Netflixes around the world. So what I can do is open up NordVPN, and with a few quick clicks, I can move IP address from Canada to the United States, or... Maybe, maybe we'll wait to the next election before trying the United States. Instead, I'll move to where my family is from, that's Spain, and we just click there. Nord will find the best server to make sure I've got uh, decent latency so the stream comes in okay, and then it switches, and there we are. So I go back to Netflix, I refresh the page, and boom, three seasons. And that's how I use NordVPN. 
As part of this sponsorship, viewers of this video can get a special 70% off a 3-year plan at nordvpn.com slash jose. This special offer makes your subscription $3.49 per month, which lets you browse on all sorts of devices. And if you use the code jose, that's J-O-S-E, you'll get an extra month of Nord for free. This is also a way I think viewers can support this channel and get a little something extra back as well. So do click on that link below if you're in need of a decent VPN. Style is very subjective. I'm a fan of simple, effective prose, and some writers can use language so effortlessly you could read them writing about anything. Ben Shapiro is not one of these writers. One of the things he does in this book that constantly bugged me were these short little one-sentence paragraphs. Here's how he ends one scene. He glanced up at the face of the Secret Service agent on his back. A thick burn scar marked his face near his ear. Then everything went black. The short sentences are meant to emphasize each one. It's like writing in bold or underlining the sentence, except less obvious. Unless you do it all the time, and Ben uses this technique dozens of times. She felt tears well in her own eyes. She couldn't cry. Not yet. So she went to work as usual. Ben also has a problem with starting so many sentences, particularly action scenes, with the word then. Then, without hesitating, he stabbed the boy through the eye. When he looked up, he saw the explosives packed along the ceiling. Then he noticed a camera, operated by remote, in the corner of the hallway. The annoying thing about these sentences is that they're just as effective without the word then. This is what they look like removed, and they're fine. By constantly starting a sentence with then, it creates the impression that this story is being told to me by a child. And I want to give some special consideration to the many names Ben has come up with for this novel. Here are some of my favorites. Brett Hawthorne. Mark Prescott, Levon Williams, Ricky O'Sullivan, Bubba Davis, Jack Blatch, Southers, Ibrahim Ashami, Jim Balaban, Bill Collier, Billy Barron, James Easton McLawrence, Aidan Foster, Beauregard Feldkoff, and a special shout out to Jeff Jeffords, the soldier who's only mentioned in one paragraph where we find out his head was cut off and sent to Governor Davis. For anyone planning to write a book where a gruesome decapitation happens, try not to give the victim a silly name like Mark Markson or Bill Bilson. One thing we get a lot of in this 266 page book is characters, dozens of them, many appearing for no more than a few paragraphs, but what's most telling is how these characters are presented to us. Let's take the subplot of Ricky O'Sullivan shooting the 8 year old boy. The boy's name is Kendrick Malone, though we don't even learn that until after he's been murdered. The scene where the two encounter one another is told entirely from Ricky's perspective. We see the fear, doubt, and regret through his eyes, creating sympathy for the character. We never get Kendrick's perspective. Part of that may be because they were trying to hide that this was a setup, but even after he dies, we do meet his mother, Regina Malone, who is briefly described as a slightly overweight black woman. And that's about it. She's never a focal point. We never really learn anything about her, aside that she's being used as a prop by Levon and Jim. The Malone family, although victims in this narrative, are without a story or perspective. They're just props being used to tell us the story of a sympathetic police officer and two conniving civil rights frauds. When we find out Officer Ricky isn't being charged with the crime of murdering a child, we get a brief rundown of the district attorney, Kim Donahue. She's introduced as a straight-shooting Republican who got into office after her Democratic competition dropped out of the race because of a sex and corruption scandal. Ben tries to give her backstory so we can feel sympathy for her when Detroit's black community is enraged by her decision to not press charges against Ricky. Ben has no interest in even trying to present the grievances of black residents of Detroit. People are reduced to easily manipulated props. We get no backstory or history for Regina Malone or Kendrick. They're just there to be manipulated by others. We can see this pattern repeated throughout the book. We get a lengthy story and explanation to create sympathy for Soledad as she descends into terrorism. We see her flee from her ranch, see her friend get hit with a drone strike, and then watch her try to assassinate the president. This is taken from the final page of the book, after Soledad has rescued Brett and they're driving towards freedom. Brett looked at her. You're that terrorist. I prefer Rancher. The government made me a terrorist. No, said Brett. You made you into a terrorist. You're free to get out at any time.
Brett went silent. This part of the book could easily be considered apologetics for a certain type of terrorism, and it's all told in a way that we're supposed to feel sympathy or compassion or at least understanding for Soledad and her actions. This book is filled with terrorists, but we never get more than the briefest explanations for why they're doing what they do, at least when they're from the Middle East or if they're Muslim. What's telling is who he attempts to give depth, characters whose actions he feels that need to be rationalized as blameless, like the cop who shoots an eight-year-old kid, or justified, like the ranchers who decide to bomb buildings, and naturally the lines being drawn are to advance a distinctly right-wing worldview. Ben doesn't seem concerned or interested in the stories of the black residents of Detroit who aren't scumbags, or any terrorists who are swept up under this charismatic leader, or even the charismatic leader himself. No, these are cardboard cutouts for the more detailed protagonist to fight against. One of the major players I've only briefly touched on in this book is the media. A quick way of understanding who the novel is trying to portray as sympathetic is seeing what their stance towards the media is. For example, Brett and Ellen show open disdain or disgust for the press at every turn, whereas President Prescott is enthralled by them. And Levon uses the media as a tool for manipulation. In these two cases, the media is portrayed as being powerful enough to lead around the most powerful man in the world, but so weak and fragile that it can be easily manipulated by a drug dealer. The media is a corrupting force in these books, although Ben points out a few exceptions, like Fox News or conservative bloggers. The few times we meet reporters or journalists in this book, they're often grimy sneaks like Jack Blatch, who spreads fallacious stories about Brett cheating on Ellen, or they're empty-headed reporters who fawn over Leon, particularly reporters who, the book makes sure we know, are white and female. Just to add a little extra bit of racism to this. The novel is creating this world run by the media, and that media has been captured by people with bad intent typically activists with left-wing politics. Considering this book itself is a piece of media, it's not a huge leap to assume it's playing the same game, acting as a form of propaganda to advance a narrative. Damn the facts and logic it has to trample under its feet. If the left does it, this book seems to argue, shouldn't the right do it as well? Left-wing activists are never portrayed as honest actors in this novel. They are often drug dealers or hustlers seizing power or environmentalists employed by a foreign government. That one random scene in the book's epilogue of the various nations on Earth led by China uniting to invade the US isn't as random as it seems. It actually makes perfect sense in the worldview of this book. It's presenting a vision of America that is under siege, seemingly from within, but in truth the danger comes from outside its borders. This is an intensely tribal book, dripping with fear and paranoia fear of non-Americans, and often American people of color, as an existential threat to the United States. And those who represent the liberal establishment are enabling these people to destroy America. It's a bit scary to think what sort of mind produces this kind of fiction. A mind so racked with fear over a world that's out to destroy everything it holds valuable. Going back to some of those quotes plastered on this book, it's even more troubling to see them speaking on how real this book felt. And it must be a feeling because it's literally non-factual, it's completely made up, and it's hilariously inaccurate whenever it discusses geopolitical dynamics in the real world. Aside from the outrageous plot, to identify with the concerns of this book is to identify with fear and paranoia. To assume the world, or more accurately America, is headed towards chaos with one more loan to the Chinese or every time there's a protest over a black child being murdered. There are a few small moments in this book where I got the impression that it was starting to sound like an honest depiction of the mainstream left in America. I remember one speech by President Prescott that seemed to be a version of something you might have heard former President Obama say, only not as well written, but then the game would be given away completely by diving into Prescott's mind to get some vapid line about how much he loves the cameras or that he's ogling some blonde in the front row. Ben can't seem to portray left-wing politics as anything more than a farce, as if there's nothing genuinely motivating that side of the political spectrum. At least, not anything more meaningful than vanity. I suspect these are the straw men Ben wishes he was fighting against, and sometimes thinks he is. By using fiction, he can make them say the things he thinks they secretly believe. Ironically, this book isn't giving us a glimpse into anyone's mind, except for Ben Shapiro's. Books very rarely portray the world in a completely comprehensive and meaningful way. 
In the hands of truly great writers, they provide us insights into the small fragments that make up the human experience. What shabbier writers reveal is something about themselves and how they see the world. Ben's book doesn't reveal any worthwhile social commentary. Rather, it lets us look deep into his small, paranoid mind and displays the ugly, prejudiced lens through which he sees the world. And Ben wants us to see it that way, too. Feel like I gotta repeat? Please don't read this book. I got my copy from the library. I did not give Ben Shapiro another sale. Genuinely believe we can learn something using literary analysis regardless of the quality of the book. And I feel like I learned something reading this, and it wasn't a complete loss. I hope maybe you got something out of this video too. All those names you see flashing up on the screen are my delightful, lovely patrons who make videos like this possible. If you would also like to be one of those lovely people, you can head over to my Patreon and offer a small monthly donation. If you'd like to support me in a non-financial way, you can leave a comment, like this video, or subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Also, if you want to be updated on the comings and goings of my YouTube channel, remember to hit that bell. It, uh, I've been told, is very important. Also, you can follow me on Twitter, ask me a question on Curious Cat. Thank you, everyone, for watching.